A grossly yeah. underutilized provision in my opinion. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. I think it was transitioning across, but there's a lot more open uses now. So um, it's in the very front of the scheme and it would take a little while to go and double check. But I think it is in the same. Yeah, sorry. Not the top of my head, I can't think that. It's under the interim planning scheme, it's in uh, what's considered special provisions. Uh, under part nine, or part C, section nine. And it's a provision that basically means that if it's a prohibited use uh, in that zone, if you have a heritage building, then it's a discretionary use. Which means, but there's a caveat to that, is it's a discretionary use provided it's actually um, maintained the heritage you know, integrity of that building. So just because it's you know, prohibited to have a nuclear power plant, you can't have, go and find a heritage building to have a nuclear power plant. But if you've got a, um, let's, uh, for example, you might have a um, heritage building in an agricultural zone, and it's prohibited to have um, an art gallery or an art studio, um, but you could actually have, if you have a, you know, a heritage listed building in some form, because it doesn't actually have to be state listed uh, currently, um, you could actually have it as that use. It's provided that it's actually maintaining the heritage buildings. The aim of that is actually to give some value to that heritage building and sort of pay off. Um, I think it's still in there, but I'm, to be honest, I'm, I can't off the top of my head. You have to still do it within the context of 35E. You need to do it in the context of that section there, whether it's meeting that or not, uh, and the objectives of the looper. You might want to seek some own, your own specific advice on that. Because, like I said before, well, the councils have actually been allocated those guidelines, and the councils have to stick to those guidelines. And in theory, those guidelines have already been approved, the SPPs have already been approved, and the heritage provisions and the heritage codes are already been approved um, in various different times have advertised them. So it's how has council actually applied those provisions? And if you don't believe the council applied, which is in accordance with this. Maybe I could just jump in. When a council submits its local provision schedule to the Tasmanian Planning Commission, it has to sign off on the fact that the document complies with legislation, regional land use strategy, state policies, and all those sort of things. And they're the elements that the Tasmanian Planning Commission is reviewing before they'll advise the council, yes, your local provision schedule is right to go to public notification. So for someone to find a ground of why the local provision schedule wouldn't comply with those higher level documents, you'd have to have some very, very strong or you know, unusual information that was missed by everybody previously in the scheme. So um, in the experience of the ones that have transitioned, those were never the issues that were raised. Um, where representations have been made to the Tasmanian Planning Commission, uh, it does relate to the things that Trent has pointed out, where people have said, I don't think you've applied the zone correctly, or um, you know, these precincts shouldn't apply for these reasons, or you've missed something here, or we don't agree with your interpretation of the implementation guideline. You know, we think it should be this because it meets X, Y, Z. One of the questions I had for you, Trent, was can you perhaps explain, and while it may not be an issue for Hobart because it is a very rural resource council, um, for example, in Clarence, we've been trying to get our head around what it means to go to the local provision schedule. And at Clarence Council has made the decision, because we don't have a heritage officer on the staff, that we will not be having a list of local heritage places. So the only thing in Clarence that's going to be assessed is the precinct, and we only have the one, which is Richmond. So what that means is, because the scheme, in the state planning scheme, has actually increased the number of things that are exempt. So for example, in the current scheme, 
um, even if there were major road upgrades or new provisions of road by state, uh, the, the uh, state government, uh, if it was impacting on a heritage place, they'd have to, it wouldn't be exempt. It's now exempt. Mm -hmm. Up to within three metres, the property matter. So, you know, while you can get excited, and this is another thing, is the schemes really work in a layered scenario. So the provisions in any uh, clause of a code or a zone, almost the last thing you look at, you know, you really have to work through what's known as the machinery clauses. And the other thing in the machinery clauses of the schemes, whether they're the interim or the new ones coming in, um, in fact, the new ones coming in, I think it's very clearly states up front that this document has been vetted and is considered to comply with the State Land Use Planning Act and the Regional Land Use Strategies. So when a council makes a decision, notwithstanding Brendan's advice about what's in the Local Government Act or what might be in the council policy uh, or strategic plan, they, and from a mechanical point of view, one, when they're assessing a, a development application against the scheme, at best they can go through the objectives of the performance criteria and to the zone purpose statements, unless there's some other thing in the front, like representations of race, something you know that wasn't considered in the DA from word go. Um, but so it's very constrained what councils can and can't do going forward. And because of the exemptions, so let's take a scenario in Clarence. If you have a heritage place, listed with Heritage Tasmania, and it's in a residential zone, and the work you're proposing to do is exempt because um, the detail of the work you're doing does not um, exceed any of the building envelopes or the setbacks or any of those other requirements that are in the general residential zone. It's an established use in a residential zone so to be a no permit required. So council will have no remit to say anything or require you to make a development application. Even if it is, all we can do as a council is let the owner know, for your advice, you may wish to talk with Heritage Tasmania before you undertake the work, but council has no reason to refuse the proposed works under the planning scheme. You have to check each council, because some councils have taken the state heritage listings and created registers of local places which double up on the heritage state listing. The only time council can deal with it if it's in their schedule of heritage places. And what I'm saying to you is most councils that don't have the resources of Hobart or Lonson don't have a list of local heritage places. They're relying on the Tasmanian heritage list to do it. And you'll be surprised which councils will. So some councils have gone off and done the effort yeah. And the reason being is, um, from some councils' experience, state listings can no longer be state listed, but there will be a correct. heritage value to that site, and so the choice was by a lot of the little councils that we still wanted to have that. So if you, maybe, some of the red circle stuff, and we can make these slides available on TASPIN's website so you can go through them. But that is the reason why some councils have chosen to list them and double up on them because if and when Heritage Tasmania delists them from the Heritage Tasmania register, they'll still be captured by the local place register. So it's really a case. But that circled area actually highlights that if it's on both the local register for the council and the state heritage register, register, then the only thing council can assess is those elements that aren't actually documented on the state heritage register that registers being the important bits. So for example, um, Brendan showed us that the title is there, but if the description says the important thing on this title is the stable wall built by convicts at the back of the property, then that's the only bit that Tasmanian Heritage Register would look at and council can look at everything else, or vice versa. That makes sense? It's going to be very complicated, that's what I'm saying. So from my perspective, it's not easier, it's cheaper, simpler, or faster. I want so. to deal with every day. Yes. Yeah, that's potential.
eventually there are things that are going to fall through the crack because we, we can advise count, uh, owners, like Clarence does a lot of preliminary assessments through charge for people, so we'll pick it up. So by the way, you're, you know, you're listed on the State Heritage Register, you might want to go and talk to them. At the moment, the process is uh, Heritage Tasmania is a mandatory referral authority for councils. Uh, four places of heritage listing. Yep. Um, not it's not issue. clear to me that that's going to be the same because that power is in the Heritage Act, not in the Lupa Act. Mm. So yeah, I don't know your experience of that. I imagine it would still yeah. stay there. So. Yeah. 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 So it's a bit of a complicated process. So that's all we're trying mm. to flag for you. If, if there is, but as I said, the only precinct that um, would apply as an overlay in balance is Richmond. So, you know, we look at the zone, we first we check, is this thing exempt from meeting planning? And if it is, then don't go past go. They're often running onto the building stage. And they may not need building approval either. If it's minor work, so I just need to notify them. So, you know. <laughs> Then if, if it's a zone provision, we look at that. Then we look, is there a specific area plan, a code? No. Is there a specific area plan? You know, so you work through it. But where there's a higher order thing, you only address it to the extent that it differs from the um, provision in the first zone. So for example, a classic one is height. So in a res general residential zone, you might be able to go to 8.5 metres, and I think what Franklin down was maximum six in the heritage precinct. So the six metre height would override the 8.5 metre height in a residential zone. So it's quite a mechanic process, statute assessment. Yes, we are, because the machinery clause say the scheme has been assessed to meet the requirements yep. of LUPA by the Tasmanian Planning Commission. That's Unless it's picked up in the in the zone or code as a mandatory code, um, the development there are still mandatory codes that might apply to development in the residential code. Um, in the current one, it's called parking and access. In the new scheme going forward, it will be called uh, parking and sustainable transport. <laughs> to pick up on bike well, riding, Emma, there's provisions for bike riding. <laughs> but yes, so the code might still be relevant. Yeah. So, for example, if they're, you know, um, oh, well, I don't know. Would yeah, you, you it would be unreason uh, unlikely if you're, you know, adding a little porch that, uh, that you've changed no, the traffic would, volumes and it would still, still apply. Still apply. Yeah. Yeah, the rest of the scheme still applies. But yeah. I mean, you might, you might be um, exempt on a heritage matter yeah. because, yeah. like I said at the very beginning, though, mm -hmm. a lot of these issues will, will work their way through when applications start to go through, okay? At the moment, it is a um, theoretical transition scheme. Mm. And I say that with a smirk. Um, but it's still, there will be, the devil will be in the detail. And you know, it is still, you know, we're not, sections of the planning <coughs> is not being thrown out completely. But then also, how it's being dealt with, in the sense that um, you know, once upon a time, a my colleague told me that you know, when I was learning, planning is where you find all the problems to sort it out to make building easier. Mm. Right? But it's the reason why planning has all the problems. You know? It's our job to create hassle, you know? to get all those issues and tie them all up and deal with them there and then. So when you go to your building permit, it's a breeze. But there's the miss conception with that to say, oh look, the planning's got all these problems, let's just deal with the building or let's just deal with it over here and let's deal with it by that act. And it's shifting some of those issues onto those other acts. So I think it's not necessarily stop dealing with those issues that you're suggesting, but they're putting them in a different spot and you may have a different way of dealing with it. This gentleman over here has been having his hand up for quite a while. So. Well, that would be the uh, same as any other planning, planning, uh, strategic planning challenge. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, that's correct. As we go through, the process would be to get council through that, uh, and if council agreed with it, then it has to go to um, the, the TPC, the Tasmanian Planning Commission, and if they agreed with it, then you put it on board. And in theory, which I agree with with the new scheme, I probably don't agree how it's being done at all, but I agree with in the new scheme, is that that process should be easier to do because you've actually now got the focus on that, you've got the wording is consistent and everyone's dealing with the same sort of terminologies so that Clarence can do in Bell Reef, you know, the same as Battery Point or something because you're actually dealing with the same terminologies and things. So in theory, that sort of process now, a community could actually get involved in to say, okay, we're consistent in this area and you know, we want to put in for this to be a precinct. Well, that, that, you could even look at list your own house, yes. Yeah. But then you'd still have to go through the same processes. You'd have to actually show why it's actually a heritage significance. Okay. okay? And a precinct is, um, I'm not sure if Peter touched on it, a precinct is that area that has a commonality of heritage significance. Now you can actually have individual houses listed within a precinct um, for their own, you know, they could also be a state. You could have the house in the middle that's actually of having a state benefit uh, of heritage, yeah. but then that precinct could be just a local listing precinct. And you know, for that street, for example, my house is in, um, is in uh, locally listed within a precinct and you know, as an individual, it's got no benefit at all. There's no heritage value to the house as an individual, but it actually forms something as part of that and actually helps us have strength. It's still with the state. Sorry? If it's a state listed heritage site, so yes. with the Heritage Tasmania, then it's still with Heritage Tasmania. Council don't have any comments on it. The council wouldn't stop you at the moment. The council doesn't have that authority either at the moment. It's currently with the state government. Uh, and, and this is where I disagree with Andrew here. And <laughs> so this, and I also disagree with Peter on this one, because it depends on which council you're at, and it depends on the wording you're at, and it depends on the listing of it. Hobart has a lot that actually recognises the significance of internal works. But not every council has that on there locally listed. So a lot of local listings only deal with the external. And I, and I appreciate it's a problem for Hobart because a lot of their local listings have significant issues internally and significant values internally, but it's not necessarily a problem for a lot of other councils because they're not locally listed or recognising internal works. Okay? Yeah. And I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm saying historically that probably is an issue, but historically that for a lot of councils is not going to be a problem because it's just a transition across. If, uh, if it's not mentioned in, in the... Um, in, in the Listing wording for the state, the right. for locally listing, yeah. that there's actually something specifically identified internally, then council has nothing to say. Council has nothing there. I'm not knowing the specifics on that, but that would, if if council overruled the decision, you've still got capacity to appeal that ground. That's still valid you know, for any representatives. Yes, that's still the process that we've got to deal with, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, look, I'm not going to defend that process, but you know, that's the process that we have to deal with. Um, the, it, would, it also comes down to ensuring that the wording at the strategic stage is actually quite concise as well. Right. And, and it, it, that's where the emphasis has to be done. And if it is actually 
recognised for that. And there's also a, I think, um, a misconception on whether something's heritage values and something's streetscape values. And whether there's, you know, there's a, I think they, they blur quite a lot as well because of, you know, it's a lovely street because it's, you know, as for example, everyone's set back, you know, five metres or a few metres, everyone's got nice trees down the side. But if you actually look at the heritage value of those buildings, there's actually no heritage values to those buildings. I'm not saying in this, this case at all, but so, and then it actually gets, the heritage is argued over the urban design of the street. And instead it should have actually been the urban design, maybe been argued. A week, how long have we got on that? <laughs> Um, and that, you know, it, it sort of is a. This is where my concern was with the, the borough charter not being used as a, a backing to actually strengthen some of those values and some of the, you know, the decision making within the heritage points because it does deal with how that is actually explored. Um, but you know, it is an issue. And, and um, to sum up, yeah. It, does have some responsibility on the community to actually lodge those appeals uh, when council's gone down a direction. Um, but yeah, I'm, yes, it is expensive. Um, but money well spent because when the decision does come down, the next time council planners think about assessing one of those, they think, oh, what was the last decision? How should we be interpreting these clauses? So, you know, hopefully then does lead to greater consistency of interpreting the clauses. Because, you know, I don't know if you've had a closer look at the wording, but there's a lot of changes happening to the state planning provisions which are becoming fuzzier and more subjective. So where previously objectives were written, for example, must not cause a loss of amenity mm -hmm. or must positively <coughs> contribute or something like that, it's now written more like must not unreasonably cause. It's like a double negative. How do you prove a negative? I mean, you know, and it becomes very difficult in some instances. So that's the subtle shift as well. Uh, and even though, for example, you know, um, Trent has emphasised that it's potential, you know, you'll hear it a lot. Mr. Gutman has said it a lot. You know, we're going from general residential to general residential. It's the same zone. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but the provisions have changed. Your minimum lot size is different. Your setbacks are different. You know, it's like <laughs> the level of development in that zone is different. The purpose of the zone is different. The use classes is Transition is different, so it's not a transition. But in an overarching sense, yes, the LPSs don't necessarily deal, I think, with the um, local area objectives very well. Other municipalities which I won't name, um, have taken out and put them into specific area plans. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's where it's meant to actually go, apparently. So they've taken out the, you know, if it's significant enough, let's say, for example, um, Sandy Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just going to take it around. Let's say that the main street of Sandy Bay has its own local area objective. Well, then that should be taken out and put into as a it's a specific area plan that overrides that part of Sandy Bay, almost like a precinct does, mm. in addition. And okay, so it's the urban design, urban planning ideas behind that should be in, a, in that. Um, others have actually designed, you know, drafted the local area objectives into the purpose provisions mm. on those clauses. So, you know, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's a issue that has been um, around with the performance based schemes for a very long time um, and having the joy of working in the Kingborough planning scheme you know, a long time ago um, and the tribunal quite a bit over local area objectives. So I can understand why um, there's a desire to actually get rid of them because it's been very clunky how they've been used. Um, 
but I think there's also been a misunderstanding of how they could actually be utilized as well. I'm not aware of the timing uh, constraint or otherwise on the councils on well, when they have to action them. I know certainly once the TPC provides directions to go live, you then have uh, whatever the time frame is that the TPC is giving you to go live. Um, and for example, because as you say, there's pressure to implement these faster. Um, Clarence Council, for example, has had a number of issues come up through the public consultation process that haven't been resolved, uh, that will require amendments to the LPS once it's implemented. So we're, they're being dealt with by directions from the TPC to Clarence <coughs> Council to deal with them once the LPS is presented. But I haven't read the actual directive, so I can't tell you whether that's the time in. But I will uh, check into that and we'll publish something on the testing website with the questions that we haven't been able to answer. Well, there's the some mechanics of the transition. Yeah. So, for example, um, that's what the ministerial directives were about. So the minister had a look what was in everybody, or well, people on the TPC on his behalf, obviously, had a look at what was in everybody's uh, interim planning scheme at the moment in relation to heritage places. Uh, and they made a determination that, you know, you can transition your existing list into the local provision schedule. And as Trent pointed out, you can't add to it, you can't change it. Unless you've done some strategic, some strategic work. work to justify it while you're making the change. Um, so, for example, I know one council went through and did some uh, work and engaged a heritage consultant uh, to look at their significant trees, and they've now got some heritage trees which previously they didn't have in the interim scheme. So, so there is change possible, but for the most part, what you'll see in the Council lists of local places is what was in the interim scheme. Different words. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the um, the two mega, a specific area plan would be uh, it doesn't necessarily restrict it to a heritage precinct, so it could be okay. um, you know a heritage hospital. precinct. Yeah, a hospital is a area plan. Or, you know, the flight path. The if it's a heritage precinct, yes. But, right. okay. um, but, and it really fits in within that. You could actually have a precinct. In yes. So, so one of the things to get your head around, the main purpose of the local provision schedule was to spatially align or deploy the state planning provisions. So that to take them from words to say these words apply in these areas. So through zone maps, through your precinct maps, your serious specific area maps. That's how that, that's the purpose of the local provision schedule. Now where specific area plans come in, not only do they provide the geographic context, but they can change and modify the provisions in the state plan provisions. So you can make different ordinances. And you have to then say, when you read one of these, it will say, um, this uh, replaces you know, the height provision in the general residential zone of the SPP, or this modifies the subdivision provisions of them. Right? So whenever there's a clause or an ordinance in a specific area plan, it has to say how it relates to the underlying provisions. So that's the difference between the set. Whereas precinct generally will apply the provisions of the SPPs but in the zone. It will just show you where they apply. But the SAT can also change the provisions. Yes and no. It ultimately depends on the decision makers really. Um, if the decision makers are doing the right job and looking at an application against the criteria in the relevant planning scheme, um, then it should be okay, whether it's the Heritage Council or whether it's the local council. It's arguable that a local council with elected members may be subject to um, a little bit more persuasion than, say, the Heritage Council, but 
So sometimes the Heritage Council can make inconsistent decisions as well. And, you know, I, it's a problem with two, with two bodies making a decision as well, or it can be a problem. And I can give you, well, I can give you three examples, but I'll just talk on one example where, that I'm familiar with. There's a, a little street in Battery Point called Arthur Circus, which has got probably about 18 or 19 single story mid 20th, uh, 19th century cottages. They were all built from the late 1840s to about 1860. Um, some of them have got dormer windows, but most of them are just single story buildings. There was an application to build a two story extension behind one of the cottages, and it was a very small, modest extension. It was only a single room, but it went up behind the building and it was something that you would see um, no matter where you looked at it, you'd, you'd see it. Anyway, it went to the Heritage Council. The Heritage Council, who had listed all about the circus and all the cottages in Lipitaly, ended up approving the application. And the rationale for doing that was that it wasn't actually harming, in a physical sense, the existing building. They were more concerned in a way about what was happening to the existing building and this was giving the owners an opportunity to you know, have another bedroom, etc., etc., without actually harming the physical fabric of the building. So they gave it a tick. The Hobart City Council looked at the application and said, this is actually harming how that building appears in the street. It's actually harming um, the, the contribution of that building generally to Arthur Circus. It's going to create something quite different in Arthur Circus than all the other buildings aren't. And so the Hobart City Council refused the application. So the, the developer said, oh, what do I do now? So they went to the tribunal. And fortunately, the tribunal actually upheld the council's decision to refuse it. Um, but this is the problem, is the Heritage Council, who you would think are actually making decisions to actually preserve the state's heritage, because that's what the Heritage Act says, they don't always make um, decisions that actually follow through. Um, unfortunately, it's, mm. it's, it's, you know, but then it, this, look, if we could have had a similar situation where the Heritage Council refused it and the local council approved it, we've had things like that as well. Mm. Um, the big concern to me, just going back on something else about the interiors, mm. um, before, um, before this, I think it was before the state legislation came in, or before the particular building was re um, registered on the state register, an application came in to remove the interior furnishings or the pews of a, a very early church, an 1830s church. And the, the application was to basically remove the pews. Now, um, the <coughs> The Hobart City Council actually refused that application on the basis that those that church, that furniture, you know, the, the box views, etc., was something built in the 1830s with the church. They were integral to the church. They are like pieces of antique furniture in a way. Not only that, this 1830s church is one of the earliest churches. Um, of that particular denomination in the world. It, it was happening at the same time that these buildings were being built um, in, in England, where the, that particular denomination had sort of established. This was one of the fir first colonial examples of, of a church. Um, here it is in Hobart, and we've got a number of churches. I mean, there's Wesley Scots, the synagogue itself, so St George's. There are a number of buildings all built in the 1830s and 40s in Hobart that have survived. And he was someone, or a group of people who thought, oh no, we don't need the truth. And so, you know, if, if you don't have control over what happens on the interior of a building, you know, let alone your fireplaces, let alone your timber floors, let alone your ceiling roses, etc., etc., you this is not heritage, this is not protection of heritage. Yeah, that's my that's my soapbox because it's something I feel really strongly about. You don't want to go inside a building and, and basically say, oh well, where is it? Where's it gone? It's, it's you know the soul of the building has gone, 
if you're actually allowed to be removed. And if you go back to legislation and the objects of the Act talk about conserving buildings, letting people work the insides of buildings isn't conservation. Some, some work requires building application, like demolition work can sometimes need a building application. And if people who haven't got a building application, it, it, sometimes there are ways in which you know, it gets picked up. Facadism is a really interesting sort of yeah. thing. Um, and look, I, I would say generally, if you're going to protect the building, you, you protect all of it. But there are situations when sometimes particular aspects of the building might be more important than others. Yeah. And they might, even when the building was built, sometimes in the 19th century, um, some warehouses were built with elaborate, you know, ornate Victorian facades with classical columns and, you know, statues, etc., etc., and all beautifully intricate work. Once you get past the facade, it's basically like going out of a dying box. Mm. Yeah, you go to Ballarat and see places like that. Um, and so, by, you know, if you actually replace that, you know, corrugated iron box or whatever, yeah. with something else, is it actually having a huge impact on the cultural heritage values? Yeah, yes and no. But in the case of the one down in um, Harry Street, the, the, where they built that new premier, that, that building, which was actually the hydroelectric department, um, originally that was the, um, that Tudor Gothic building, the sense of it, it had actually had a, a makeover probably in the 1950s or 60s oh, or even later. The building behind was in fact, in fact all the interior was all 1970s. So behind there wasn't really anything of cultural heritage value. What was important on that side in fact was the facade. Yes. Mm. Yeah. But whether they should have actually added stuff above it, mm. picking up on top, mm. that's a moot point. I don't know about percentage, I don't like in terms of what is listed, I have no idea. Um, there's probably a greater concentration, you know, in terms of per square metre in Tasmania than there is in other states. Um, and in terms of population, there may be a greater percentage. But in terms of pure numbers, I mean, you've only got to wander around regional Victoria, regional New South Wales to realise there are, there's just a treasure trove of heritage buildings. I mean, I'm constantly amazed when I, when I travel, um, you know, in Queensland and so on. I mean, it, it's, it's just wonderful. Australia is full of wonderful regional towns and villages. Once you get outside the capital cities, we are really, really fortunate. A lot of those buildings and a lot of those towns and villages actually still have a wonderful um, sense of cultural heritage. So I don't know in terms of numbers. But in terms of you know, how do we celebrate it? That's what we should be doing. It's, the importance to me of actually listing places on the register shouldn't be simply to control what you can do and what you can't do. It should actually be in, in almost what the National Trust did when it started registers in the 1960s, celebrating, saying these are these are what we have inherited, these are the important places. Um, you know, the community should be aware of them and we should, we should actually be, we should be providing information about it because if you tell people why their place is listed, give them information about it, give them, you know, when it was built, who it was built for, etc., then all of a sudden they think, oh, yeah, we, this is important, this is what we should be looking after. Education is the, is the key. Mm -hmm. If you tell people about why their place is important, why their street's important, why their suburb is important, they will have some sort of ownership. Of, yeah, we actually, we, we, we like that. We, and they, they can, it just helps them articulate what's important. So then you don't need a plan scheme because they want to do it anyway. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't agree more. It's just that it, there's actually no, you know, the other part is you, you know, the intangible cultural value to it is that actual what you actually do with yeah. the space. And if people aren't actually using that space, they don't have a passion for that space or the stories that come from that. Yeah. And, you know, if they're not aware of those stories, yeah. 
why does it matter? Why are we keeping these, preserving these buildings? You know, it doesn't matter how old that building is, if it really, if we don't care about that story to that building, you know, I can think of a number of buildings that have actually gone in Tasmania, and in just in my short lifespan of working in Tasmania, and you know, that's been 15 years, quite a few buildings that really should have been preserved and treasured, but they've got nothing to do with convicts, they've got nothing to do with sandstone, yeah. and they've got nothing to do with timber getting, but they're fantastic you know, industrial buildings, mm -hmm. and they've gone. And because we don't tell the story, and it's not part of our story. I imagine there would be, and um, from my caveat, I haven't been involved in, at all with high bars. No, I was asking Brad. Yeah, sorry. But um, from a planning scheme perspective, and some of the planning schemes that I have been involved with, that was the reason why we actually went down the uh, choice of listing individually, so that you know, we could actually have those sites looked at from an urban you know, surrounding, exactly as you're discussing. You know, there was actually that, that discussion, I recall having that discussion several times. If it's a precinct now, it should still be a precinct. Precinct going forward. Going forward. Mm -hmm. And so those issues would still be looked at. Yeah. And just to clarify, with the specific area plans, um, the legislation required that council do that strategic work and they had to demonstrate that the area that they were spatially defining and trying to put different provisions into um, was significant from an environmental, um, social or economic reason. So you had to demonstrate those things before you could do a specific area plan on top of your transitioning um, scheme information. So. Yeah, the bar was set quite high for uh, councils to make changes to get them into the state planning with those main plans. So, yeah. so. It will be patchy, I guess, and that's the message to take out. And while I know we're all concerned about the Hobart heritage, particularly today, um, you know, if you're talking to family and friends, um, share the information because it's going to be different in the different councils, despite the mantra that the state planning scheme is mm. uniform. But, you know, the local provision schedules are still going to be quite different, as Brendan pointed out. I looked at a scheme at Clarence from 2007, and the whole shooting match was in a that big. If you just print out the state planning provisions, which I have done, they're this big. And then if you add 30 local provision centres on top yeah. of that, they're that big. So you might want to have a look at some of the councils that have gone across, like places like Burnie, um, Glen Orkey has gone across. So you might want to have a look at their websites on the Tasmanian Planning Commission, the high plan website, to give you that information on what it actually looks like. So you have a whole section at the front that says SPPs, and then it will have Glen Orkey LPS provisions, if they're different to the SPPs. Um, and I guess the only thing, um, coming back maybe to Brendan's comments about Heritage is what you know. the previous generations have left us, what we are creating for the new generations. I'm always surprised that, as Trent points out, that you know we get so obsessed with the colonial side of things. I love some of the mid-century stuff. Rarely is that protected in anything. Um, so you know, maybe we also need to evolve as a community what it is that we want to preserve. Um, going forward and not just be totally obsessed by the colonial elements of our past. So on that note, unless there's any other questions, we might thank our presenters. Please join us.